Yes. Oh, there we go. Yes. There should be a broadcast. So. Attendees. Unless we are already live. I see Emily Miller, Mariah Scarborough, and Taylor Schaub in the attendees. Could one of you give us a thumbs up or um, some sort of note in the Q&A as to whether or not you are able to hear us right now? Or I'm wondering if we've been going here. Q&A, I can hear everything. Okay. <laughs> So we've been rolling. Great. This apparently was not set up with a practice. Thank you, Mariah. Um, apparently this was not set up with a practice. So that's okay. Um, all right, so we are getting ready to roll here. I'm gonna go ahead and put the slide, the welcome slide up and we will get started here just a minute. This is covering up the wrong things. Nope. Okay. Chat. Thank you. Q and A. Okay, friends, we are right at the top of the hour here. Folks are rolling in. We are so glad to have you here joining us um, for this webinar. Um, I am going to um, give us just a couple more minutes to welcome everybody into the space, um, say thank you for joining us, and um, that you know this, this session is called Beyond the Selfie, body image and living with a connective tissue condition. We're primarily gonna be focused on Marfan and VEDS this evening um, and also talking about some Loewy Steets. Unfortunately, our Loewy Steets um, panelist was um, not able to join us tonight at the last minute, but, that, but I have some notes from him as well. Um, but this has been a topic that we've heard so many conversations about people wishing we would talk about it. So we're so glad to get to bring this topic um, with the help of all of our panelists. Um, so with that, I actually want to just roll over and say welcome and then do a quick introduction from, from those who are going to be on the call with us. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dr. Brad McNeil for tell us who you are. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Uh, it's nice to, to e-meet everybody. I'm uh, Brad McNeil. I'm a clinical psychologist um, based out of uh, Arizona, so I'm in the Phoenix area, and I'm also an assistant professor at Midwestern uh, University, and it's uh, very nice to be here. This is a topic that um, uh, I do a lot of work in and um, some research uh, in, a, in a separate area, and so uh, I was uh, very, very excited with the opportunity to come and um, be part of this, uh, this panel. So um, looking forward to it. Thank you. I can introduce myself next. Um, I'm Mariah and I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. I have vascular Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Um, I will be 44 in December and I've only known and had about this diagnosis um, since I was 36 years old. So that kind of brings a whole different perspective to the body image um, and that experience too. Um, I am a mental health therapist. I primarily work with children. Um, so I, I kind of picture tonight maybe going in between those roles of patients with personal experience um, and hopefully being helpful to the parents out there too tonight. Thanks. 
Thanks so much, Mariah. Um, the, our panelist who is not able to join us this evening is Brandon Crawford. If you are a part of the Lois Dietz community, um, you may have met him before. He's been um, with us for so many years, just super involved, a great um, volunteer and contributor to the Lois Dietz community. So he sent along a little introduction and um, some comments that I'll spread throughout the rest of the discussion. I sent him the questions that came up earlier uh, or that you all submitted earlier uh, when you registered. And so I'll add some of his thoughts then, but he says, I'm Brandon Crawford. I'm 28 from Eastern Kentucky. I have Lois Dietz type one. I was unfortunately unable to join this evening because I am in the hospital for preparing for possible open heart surgery. I have a fistula between my aorta and right lung. So I know that that is some news that many in our group can relate to. Um, I know this would be Brandon's fourth heart surgery. So we are hoping that that is not going to be the outcome, but if it is the case that he will be well, and I, and I know that he is in good hands. So, um, like I said, I'll be sharing some of his notes throughout. And then Kendra, would you like to do a quick introduction? Yes, hello, I'm Kendra DePinto. Um, I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I have Marfan syndrome. Uh, kind of the opposite of Mariah, I was diagnosed when I was, well, they started suspecting Marfan's when I was about a year old. So I've kind of, I grew up with this diagnosis and kind of grew into an adult with it. Um, I am, I, I write a lot and I write a lot about living with chronic illness and, uh, disability and my journey to kind of being where I'm at now has been going through a lot of, uh, self-acceptance and, uh, learning to come to terms and owning the term disabled, which is something I've kind of started doing in the last year or two. Um, prior to that, I always kind of tried to hide my diagnosis and it was only something I talked about or was a part of my life, you know, when I was preparing for open heart surgeries or spine surgery. Um, and then I would try to ignore it the rest of the time. And in the last couple of years, I've kind of let it be as important of a part of my life as it actually is because it does impact so much of what I'm able to do and kind of that journey to accepting and integrating that diagnosis into my life has also been kind of transformational in how I view myself. Thanks so much, Kendra. And then Adriana. Hi everyone, my name is Adriana and I live in Miami, Florida. Um, they all see me. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I, I like Kendra. I was diagnosed when I was, I was actually six months old. So I was a baby. So I grew up with this diagnosis. Um, I am from Puerto Rico, born and raised. I did live, um, six years of my tweens and early teens in Michigan. Um, that's why, uh, I have you know, my English skills that I have, <laughs> but I'm a native Spanish speaker. Um, and I'm really excited about this panel because body positivity and body acceptance is something that I really advocate for because my journey with it was so intense and rocky and emotional. And I wish I had someone there to give me some insights or tools or, you know, um, advice. So I'm really happy to be able to do so for others. Thank you. Well, we are so grateful to have all four of you here. Um, you all bring a unique perspective from, you know, Brad's talking from that, um, the medical pers for medical perspective or mental health pr practitioner pr perspective, and then the three of you from a lived experience, and then Mariah from both. So this is just such a wonderfully um, balanced panel, and I'm really excited to get into what we're going to talk about. So to get us started, um, we just have a few notes that we're going to go through kind of chunk by chunk. Um, we'll let Brad talk a little bit about sort of the nuts and bolts, and then... Um, 
and we'll go from there and sort of a conversational style. I apologize, my, my keyboard is being super touchy tonight. Um, so as we're going through this though, just a few housekeeping notes. If you have questions, please do drop them into the Q&A box. Um, we will try to get to as many of those as possible. Some of them have been, we have had some questions submitted ahead of time. So we'll be trying to weave those in as well. If you have a question and it does not get answered during this webinar, whether it is about this topic or something else entirely, we really, really want you to use our Help and Resource Center. Our on-staff nurse, Jan, is just like the gold standard of human beings. So even if you just like need a listening ear, she is a wonderful resource. You can reach her at marfan.org slash ask and also at loisdeets.org slash ask and thevetsmovement.org slash ask. Um, so it's all the same information, but we wanted to make it as easy as possible, regardless of which website you use most often um, to access her. She usually gets back within 24 to 48 hours. And if she doesn't know the answer to your question, she works regularly with the foundation's professional advisory board to get the answers or the resources that you need. Um, another note, this webinar is being recorded and will be shared within a few days um, along with a survey for your thoughts on this presentation. Um, there are some more educational opportunities coming up. We're a little bit like the next few months just because as we get into the winter holidays, we're not doing as many live things like this. But please, you know, just keep an eye on Mark, whichever website of the main three that the foundation uses. Um, you know, keep an eye on that site and it will keep those updated. One thing in particular that we're super excited about coming on January 22nd is our first Spanish language symposium, which will be an all day um, symposium, medical symposium about all the conditions that we serve um, all in Spanish language. So we're really thrilled to be able to offer that through the power of many volunteers and many professionals um, who can help us better communicate with those who prefer or whose first uh, um, language is Spanish. So with that, then I am going to turn this over um, to Brad for a little bit of introduction on some of this and then off we are going. Great. Well, um, again, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very excited to be part of the panel. And really, um, what uh, we're hoping for with these items is to really talk about the lived experience of, uh, of body image and, and life with a connective tissue condition. And so we know that body image is a collection of uh, all of our thoughts, feelings, physical sensations and behavior uh, in relation to our bodies and, and not an objective account of what um, what we actually actually look like, but that is also influenced by our lived experience with our bodies, how we move with our bodies, um, everything that makes us kind of uh, uh, who we are. And so um, we thought we'd spend a little bit of time um, talking about that uh, as a panel. But I don't know if who wants to, to uh, jump in and, and get us started with that. Kendra, how about you? All you're, right. You're already <laughs> unmuted, so I'll pick on you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, I feel like there's, with body image and also like having a uh, chronic illness or a condition that also affects the way you look, there's so much tied into the normal lived experience of someone ever, like anybody with body image, but also adding in the health factor and how much is tied to, for me often, how, how I feel physically can also affect how I view myself. Um, oftentimes when my body is not functioning at its best, I also have a harsher view of how my body looks and you know, when my body is in pain and I'm not able to do as much, it's not only affecting like, oh, this body doesn't work very well, but it also doesn't look very well. And there's kind of a, I think it adds a complexity to how we view ourselves when it's not just about how we look, but also how our body is responding to everything else. Absolutely. Absolutely. I wonder what other folks on the, on the panel think. Yeah, for me, um, that last bullet 
people struggling with medical conditions have unique lived experiences. That that rings very true because um, for me, I do have um, the, I guess, blessing that when you look at me, unless you know what exactly you're looking for, I may not exactly strike you as somebody who has a condition as much now. When I was younger, you can definitely, you could definitely tell a lot more. Um, but with that, it's kind of what people talk about, um, invisible conditions. And when you have those type of conditions, it's so hard for people to understand that your body does have certain limitations because they can't just see it in the naked eye. Um, and but when I was younger, it was a lot of you look so different. That's why you can't do this. And people putting limitations on my body. So it's kind of switch, switch the script a little bit. When I was younger, people would put limitations on my body because of how I looked. People thought I looked sick. People thought that I may have an eating disorder because I was so thin and long and lanky. Um, and they would put limitations on me without even knowing me. And now it's vice versa now. Um, because I am like, you know, in my woman's body to say something. Um, and thank God I do look um, like everything is fine. When, when you have to tell people, no, I can't do that. Or you know what? That's not the best thing for me for my body because of my condition. It, it, sometimes people just can't like get it. You know, it just doesn't compute. So yeah, it's a definitely a different lived experience that we have. And we, we can talk about it amongst our group because even when people say, I understand, they no, you don't really understand. You can empathize, but until you live mm -hmm. it, you really, really can't understand it. Yeah, I agree with that completely, Adriana. Um, I guess this conversation maybe came up over email or something too, and I was thinking about um, how much my personal idea of my body image has changed because <clears throat> I did not get the official diagnosis until I was in my mid thirties. Um, and the, the way that I experienced what it was throughout my life, I had a very poor body image. I would go through stages of being super angry and hating my body because it wasn't working properly or it didn't look like my friends or I wouldn't heal properly. Um, and that was really internalized and I didn't express that. Um, and then after receiving the diagnosis, it was almost like a switch was flipped. And now I had permission um, to share that and to be real about it and honest. Um, like those feelings definitely did not go away. There are still times today when I really get angry about my body and um, its limitations and how it looks and what it's doing. Um, but I guess the level of um, stress or anxiety or uncomfortableness, it, it has a place with that official diagnosis. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I've definitely, I, as someone who grew up with a diagnosis, I always kind of like, it was almost the opposite of oftentimes I was angry about, it was, I mean, not funny, but I could deal with, you know, having to take medication, all the limitations. But the thing that always made me the angriest was the fact that I looked so different and it led to a lot of bullying when I was younger. Um, and I would, you know, I was, people always assumed I had an eating disorder. People would point at me in the school hallways and it would, I would eat so much at a time just to show people around me that I was eating, uh, so that I was like, well, they can't say that this is true about me if I'm eating this much. And it was almost led to an kind of the opposite of, I was always so angry about the way I look different because I knew it was from this diagnosis. 
And I also had a conversation with someone earlier this week who was also diagnosed with Marfan's as an adult. And one thing she said she experienced was all these things that she didn't realize were, you know, different about her once she got the diagnosis and they're pointing out like her spidery fingers or her hind foot was shaped differently. And all these things that she didn't know were different about her being pointed out in a medical setting were suddenly didn't think she noticed, which is stuff I've experienced as well of, you know, one time I made the mistake of reading through my online medical chart and seeing all of the small, like skeletal differences that they put down and then Googling what those were. Do not recommend. It's horrible. Don't do that. Uh, but it's just, it's so interesting how sometimes I feel like the diagnosis can be freeing in some ways and help you have more compassion for yourself. And then other times it can unearth things that you didn't experience before. Absolutely. I mean, even as folks are describing it, I'm curious about, you know, what would you like for other people to know, not just um, just people who are making comments, but also even medical providers like you're highlighting, like what would what would be important for them to know about the lived experience of that? You know, um, I had that happen to me when I was a child. Um, I was put into a room and a whole bunch of different medical professionals came in and looked at me. And as they looked at me, um, they started saying what I needed changed or fixed, even though I don't like to use that word. But in that moment, that's how I felt. And they were highlighting things that I didn't even know were, mm -hmm. I didn't even like know were, I guess, quote unquote, wrong with me. And that really like, oh, okay, thanks for telling me that I'm even more weird <laughs> than what I thought. Um, and as a child, that really, really took a toll on my self-esteem. And um, I just can empathize so much with Kendra because I had people, you know, people thought I had eating disorders as well. I had strangers, adults and children, walk like strangers out the street, grab mm -hmm. me, like they would, grab my body without my consent and they would like grab my arm and say oh my god I feel like I can break you do you eat and it's it's just it's, I wish people wouldn't like keep your hands to yourself do one to others as you wish they did to you and for medical professionals to really like understand what um how this can mentally and emotionally scar people, especially young people as they are beginning to make a self-portrait and beginning to understand themselves. Um, perhaps when you go into, as a medical professional, something like that, go into it with also um, a mental health professional so that they can guide you as to what to say and what not to say. I, uh, oh, go ahead, Brad. No, I was just going to say absolutely. And I was going to point out, notice in some of the hearts and hands up down at the bottom of folks who had similar experiences. Sorry, Kendra. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, everything Adriana just said there, I've experienced all of that. Strangers would come up to my mom or to me or anyone in the grocery store or at a water park and just feel that they could offer medical advice um, to a stranger. And that's another thing that I've experienced um, with like doctors. I think there's a level of when you have a rare condition like Marfan's or Lois Dietz or uh, the v VEDS, VEDS is that? <laughs> VEDS. Uh, um, it's rare to see. So there have been times when I go, into a hospital for something totally unrelated or something related. And they hear that someone is there with Marfans and 30 doctors stop by. Not a single one is there to actually help with what I'm there for. They're all just there. They wanna listen to my heart. They wanna, and it's just, we're people. We are, I, there's a part of me that's like, yay, spread awareness. 
you know, it's good for doctors to know what to look for, all of that. There's part of me that's like really a hundred percent on that board. And then there's a part of me that's like, I'm also not just like an experiment. I'm not somebody that you get to just come poke and prod and listen to and, you know, learn about, do nothing for, and then just leave. And so it's kind of a weird balance. And I've seen, you know, I'll go in for something and it's totally unnecessary. I'll be in the ER. I'm like, oh, can I see your hands? No, no, you don't need to see my hands right now. We know I have Marfan's like that's, it's not relevant. So I think when you, especially with those like physical differences that are then pointed out in times when it's unnecessary, it just re-highlights that they are something that are like is noticeable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. There have been many times where um, after being admitted to the hospital, um, I go to UNMC, so a teaching hospital where there's lots of students running around and I definitely am all about the education and advocacy, um, but there have been uncomfortable times to say the least where it kind of feels like maybe they forget their bedside manner training. I don't know if they get that or not, but um, yeah, I've had a student, I was talking with my cardiologist um, and we were having a conversation about scans or something like that. And she just reached over and grabbed my arm and started kind of tracing the veins with her fingers and flipped it over to look at my wrist. And <laughs> I didn't even, I didn't know how to handle it, honestly. I don't know. Um, I just kept talking to the cardiologist and let the student enjoy her um, learning opportunity. Um, but after that, I, I kind of felt like a, yeah, like a science experiment. It wasn't a good feeling. Um, I, I wish that, you know, and, and there are many doctors who do this. I wish that more doctors would come in and you know, of course they greet you and then tell you what they're doing before they put their hands on you or um, ensure that their students, I guess, know how to be respectful before they start interacting with patients and just, you know, putting their hands on us or um, whatever it is they think that, that they have the right to do as students. Yeah, consent is very important as well as being trauma-informed because, yeah they don't know what type of type of trauma the, um, people go through just trying to live their lives every day in the streets and people being harassed and grabbed. And then you come into what's supposed to be a safe setting, which is a medical setting. And then you're also grabbed and you're also prodded and poked. So I feel like there's some trauma informed work that they also need to do. Absolutely. And, and you hit on something really, really important, uh, Adriana, a little, a little bit back where you were describing, you know, as a child or adolescent, um, and even for some of the family members who are out there tonight, just how much these things can impact um, our view of ourselves when there's identity development. But also we know with, uh, with body image, our evaluation of ourselves as people is impacted by our bodies and um, not just with physical appearance, but also how they function and how they feel. It also interacts with our, our relationships and the, and the people around us who are uh, really important. And um, I'm wondering a little bit about people's lived experience of, of that as well, um, interrelationally, relationship-wise. Um, we've talked kind of about um, folks around us that, you know, are intruding on our, our space, but um, what about other folks who are around us in relationships in relation to body image and life with a connective tissue condition? Um, I can share. I work with children primarily, and um, that has been such a blessing in so many ways because my my little friends are just very honest, and you know they are curious and learning about their world, and they have questions about how people look. Um, so you like my experience has been when it comes from a child or someone who sort of on in a different category, someone who cares about you and you know loves you, um, they are asking to learn more about you or, you know, coming from a place of curiosity and just trying to figure out 
you know, what's happening. And um, I do look different and they notice those things. Um, I don't know how many times I've been asked if why I had a black eye in session. Uh, I've never like officially had an, an injury black eye <laughs> before. They're just the really fun, you know, dark under eye circles. Um, and so when it comes from a client or someone that loves me, it's much easier to not get dysregulated and upset and defensive. Um, but I've also had people who do not care about me or who are strangers ask those questions too. Um, and I guess right now I'm still kind of experimenting with how I want to respond. I, it definitely depends on the day and my mood. <laughs> Sometimes I might just walk away and other times I, I try to think of like a somewhat appropriate comment. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, lots of inappropriate comments go through my head too. Um, and not to say that that would never come out either, but I don't know. It's, it definitely takes practice for me to, to feel good about how I respond in those situations. I completely agree with all of that. I also worked as a nanny for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And there's something that when a small child asks me about like the scar on my chest or anything else, yeah. I will happily explain it to them. Yeah. I've had parents look horrified. And when a child asks, it's a little different. I've also had like grown adults that are total strangers ask me about the scar on my chest. And I'm like, mm -hmm. we don't, we don't know each other. I've also always worked in like a customer service position and I've had doctors come in and feel like while I'm, you know, serving them coffee in the morning that they can ask me about my diagnosis. And I'm oh. like, that's, that's not the time or the place. And, but I think when it's coming from, like you said, when people I know ask about stuff, I am more than willing to share with them um, because it's normally mm -hmm. coming from a place of wanting to understand me better rather than wanting to satisfy their own curiosity. And I think that's really like the big difference in how I respond to it. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would just add to um, a note for parents, because obviously, you know, you love your kids and kids with um, Amar fans or other conditions. Um, they may want to open up and tell you how they feel and tell you they're being, being bullied or if they feel a certain way about their bodies, um, but they may not want to. And I think um, as parents, it's okay to respect their process because, you know, I'm, I'm here speaking about this, but I've healed. So speaking from a wound it's not as easy than speaking from a scar. Scars have, are wounds that have healed. So when your child or when you're still going through it, you're still, that wound is open. So just be tactful. Maybe you want to get professional help to speak to your child or to your teenager about what they're going through because it's very hurtful and they, it may be hard for them to open up, um, especially teenagers with changing bodies. Some of the subjects may even be embarrassing for them. Mm -hmm. um, so just respect their process. Don't push too much, be their friend, be their ally, love on them. And yeah, maybe seek professional help to have, to open up dialogue if that's what you're looking for. I think that's so, that's advice that I wish more parents knew. Uh, and I think that I wish you know, I think for a lot of parents, they don't know how to parent a child that has a chronic illness or anything. And that's something I wish my parents had known when I was growing up and going through that as well. I think that's the way you said that of it's a lot easier to speak from a scar than from a wound. And that's something I just experienced something earlier this week on a post I put up on Instagram of it was just of my partner. It, I wasn't in it. There was no mention of me. We went on vacation this last weekend 
and I posted a photo of him saying how nice it was to be out in the world. And I got a comment on it from some stranger who is not in my circle that just said, he loves you. Uh, he loves you even with your deformities. And then with a heart emoji and a praise hands emoji. And I, being the person I am, was like, can you care to explain what you mean by that? You want to expand on that? And they were like, oh, it's just, it's so beautiful that he loves you, even though you're different and abnormal. And I was like, none of these are the correct terms. Like, no, no, like, I have a disability, but I'm not deformed. I'm not abnormal or anything like that. And it's so, it was easy for me to take that comment and brush it off because I am at a point of self-acceptance and self-healing and unlearning so much of the like ableism and so much of the bad self-image that I grew up with. But what angered me about that comment is that there are so many people who aren't there. And that's like, if I had heard that comment five years ago, that would have broken me. That would have been so, so hard for me to hear. And now hearing that now, I'm able to say, okay, this person, this person has more things they need to learn and it has nothing to do with me. But that's because of where I'm at. And that's like, I don't know. That's why I think it's important to talk about all of this, to remind people that like, they're not alone in experiencing these things. My partner has heard some really horrible things about, oh, he's such a saint for being with her. Like I've been called damaged goods by a person in the church we used to go to and that he was so good for staying with me, even all of this. And it's like, all of that stuff can be, is so, so damaging for so many people. And I think it's important to talk about it and create a community where people feel comfortable sharing about those experiences with other people that understand and not just people who are going to try to understand. Absolutely. I, I'm noticing, Angela, there's a lot of comments coming in uh, in the chat. I, I, some of them, I, I, I think that'd be nice for some of the panel members to hear too. Yeah, I was just going to jump in and say the same. Um, so Sherry was talking about how we must all speak up for ourselves, um, even to our doctors, they are service people and we are their customers. And I know that is, you know, we talk a lot about self-advocacy, not just um, related to this, but even just to advocating related to having a, a rare condition that medical providers may still not know so much about. Um, so it is this added layer of really needing to speak up for ourselves and, and um, respect our own boundaries. Um, but there is a power dynamic that plays out with medical professionals that can, it can be tricky, right? Like you're depending on them, but also needing them to understand your autonomy. Um, it's easier said than done in some cases. Um, Bridget also says she agrees, um, had a complete stranger remark on her balding um, hair loss. But as a teenager, my mom tried everything in her power to say it was normal and not that bad. Sometimes those who love us the most want to protect us, but I wish we would have talked about it more because I knew it was noticeable. What a powerful comment. Yeah, I can definitely relate to Bridget's comment. Um, that is a really fun, I guess, minor characteristic of this. Um, and I specifically, I remember, I don't even know how many years ago it was, but I had a dream where it was just sort of like an average everyday situation. But you guys, I had this full, amazing head of hair. Like I barely recognized myself when, I don't know, I guess I walked by a mirror in my dream or something. And it was just like, oh my gosh, it was a dream, it was seriously a dream come true. Um, but yeah, my, my parents were not um, educated on how, you know, how to deal with that kind of stuff. And um, it would have been great if that was different. I think that that is one of the like best messages for parents and support people is that like, I think it's very important to acknowledge and validate 
the those experiences when there are things you know i feel like i often heard oh it could be worse or oh other people experience this too but it kind of goes back to that very first thing point that brad made of like yes other people experience this but when you add on an illness with it it's compounded and it's a totally different experience So one, we have had a few questions and I know some of the questions that were um, submitted ahead of time were kind of related to this notion of um, yes and, like what do we do about this now, right? And some of the questions um, were about specific um, physical attributes and I know some of you talked about some of those of you in your own lives, but a lot of it relates to just developing these personal resources. So I thought maybe we could actually flip back to the PowerPoint for a second and talk a little bit about these next few um, pieces that you had, Brad, that I felt like really identified what some of these behaviors are that we are experiencing. And then we can talk about, or uh, that people often are doing um, with their uh, self-image and then um, talk about some of those resources that we can develop um, to um, what manage those or respond to them in a positive way. So I'll go back to PowerPoint here just so we can see, there we go. And I think it's uh, it's clear, you know, from what folks have been sharing, from um, what folks on the panel have been discussing that um, the way we think and behave influences our, our body image. And it also influences how we feel as people, whether that, uh, you know, as anxiety, low mood, just distress that can accompany it as, uh, as Adriana was highlighting, even in childhood and adolescence. And we know that there's negative body image thoughts that, you know, can compound things. And especially when people, as the, the panel members are describing, are entering into our space and making assumptions about um, what a person's lived experience is, or even assumptions about um, uh, what they're able to do within the context of that lived experience. We know in body image in general, there tends to be um, some really sticky thoughts that tend to hang out. And, and some of the panel members actually have described these. Um, the idea that with body image scrutiny is something that comes up all the time, where um, once we kind of focus in on a particular um, aspect of appearance, or even as Kendra highlighted um, very readily, uh, you know, a physical sensation that's associated with a symptom, it can actually amplify things. Or, uh, you know, as Mariah and, and uh, Adriana were highlighting, you know, just somebody kind of grabbing our arm or somebody um, putting a focus or placing emphasis on a particular aspect of appearance can tend to magnify it for folks. And um, that magnification can come with uh, comparisons. And, and we know that comparisons are something that we all do really normally, but, um, you know, it compounds body image and it can make it really challenging. And um, some of the things that we can think about doing to feel better um, about our body image, and especially in reference to having a, a, a medical condition, um, as Kendra highlighted, that complicates that picture much, much more, um, are, are some of the things that our, our panelists have done as part of their lived experience and their journey um, that got them to, to where they are today. And so I think it would probably be very helpful for folks um, who are at the webinar to hear a little bit about that, uh, that journey of how um, folks on our panel through their lived experience have gotten to some of the acceptance, um, some of the things that have been helpful for them, some of the supports that have been helpful for them. Yeah, I would like to start. Um, I feel, am I frozen? <laughs> oh, okay, good. Nope, uh, good. <laughs> okay, because I see myself and my camera, when I see myself, I'm frozen, but if y'all can see me, that's good. Um, so, First, I would like to say that, um, yes, agree with all of it. Um, definitely comparing ourselves to others, especially as, you know, as we're developing, as we're tweens and teens, that can be really tough because, I mean, it happens even when you don't have a medical condition. You know, girls look at the other girls who are filling out a little sooner, you know, boys look at the other boys who are getting, you know, developing their muscles or their upper body strength more than they are. So that puts pressure on you. 
we know how kids can be. We know how teenagers can be with each other. Um, but then on top of that, as a person of color, you know, the societal norms and the way that, you know, European beauty standards also come out, you know, there's no way that I was going to be blonde. <laughs> there's no way that I was going to have blue eyes. There's no way that, you know, that I was going to be white. So that, especially growing up in Michigan and everyone around me <laughs> being, being white, it was like, it was tough for me. So I think that, you know, parents of color also have to take that into consideration additional is just something else that we have um and put like maybe bring 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 in people who your child can relate to that looks like your child that looks like your family um and that isn't putting in these unattainable crazy body standards body image standards um, like I was listening to Christina Aguilera and Britney Spears, but you know, maybe I should have been listening to somebody who looks more like me. Um, and you know, it's now there's a lot more diversity, which is great. So look for that. Look for role models that look like your kids. And there are right now there are there's even more diversity when it comes to body types. So that's that's really great too. Um, yeah, those are my two cents. Um, I think one thing, you know, it's funny because there's so much talk about how bad social media is for self-image, but I think one of the best things that I've experienced and some of the best connections I've made is with other people with similar conditions through social media. The number of people that I have on my Instagram that also have similar conditions and connecting with people because these are all pretty rare conditions. I didn't know anyone growing up that also had Marfan syndrome. I think I met one person one time very randomly for like a moment. And so I didn't ever see anyone else that looked like me. And so being able to now connect with people through Instagram and social media and develop relationships with those people and have, you know, conversations like these on a one-on-one -on -one basis and being able to see photos of, you know, other people that look like me and are very confident and comfortable with themselves. It's, that was something for me as, you know, I was seeing all these people that looked like me and I would have never said some of the things I would have never said the things to them that I was often saying to myself because I didn't see it in them. And it made me think, well, if I don't see these traits in them and I would never say this about them, what right do I have to say it to myself? How disrespectful is it to them to be saying these things about myself when we have so much in common? And that was something that like, that kind of changed my perspective a little bit on myself and also, it sounds so silly, but like getting clothes that fit me, I am very tall and very thin. And only in the last few years has American Eagle started selling pants that fit me, but they're the only major brand that does. But taking the time to find brands that fit you or fit your child, um, because I was always in clothes that didn't fit me well, so I didn't feel confident in them. They didn't look good on me. And it just highlighted how thin I was, how tall I was. Everything I didn't like about myself was highlighted in clothing that didn't fit me. So we had a question, um, one, one of the specific questions I wanted to bring up around this topic, um, around this sort of point from the submissions ahead of time. Um, I just, this, this question, honestly, it stopped me in my tracks. And I think this is a great one to consider here. It says, is it feasible, realistic, or even healthy to try and love every part of my appearance? Or is that just damaging me and my outlook by trying to achieve something seemingly impossible? And um, I felt like, wow, I mean, that is just, it, that really cuts right to the core, doesn't it? Because we're talking about 
um, the tools that we are developing over time or learning about ourselves in order to embrace more parts of ourselves. But is there, I, I, you know, like, is there a point where you can really say, I love all parts of myself, or is that an unrealistic goal? Um, would love to hear your thoughts on that. I know everybody's kind of in a different place in their own personal growth with this as well, but even too from Brad, like, as the professional in the room to say, you know, is this just like that self-actualization point in life that so many aspire to and, and how realistic is it to get there? Um, I don't think, I mean, I don't know. Like I, I have never met anybody that has loved every single part of their bodies. I mean, I think there's all something like there's always going to be one thing that you wish was different here and there. Um, I love how Kendra brought up the clothing because I was, you know, this thick, thin, tall, lanky girl. And then I would wear these oversized baggy clothes because I thought that it would, you know, not highlight how thin I was. But what I was doing was the opposite. I was looking like a toothpick inside a huge tent. So it's really important to, you know, learn how to dress for your body and what fabrics and colors and, you know, um, prints really like camouflage the parts you might want camouflage, but then how to also highlight the parts that you love about yourself. And it goes back to the question because I, you know, uh, there are parts that I love about myself. How can I accentuate them? And then the parts that I am not so crazy about, how can I maybe not hide them, but camouflage them or make them not as prominent? And there was also a question in the previous questions about surgery. I feel that if, if you can, you know, if you have the means, if you have the time, it, if it'll help you, if you're doing it for you, it'll help you to help your self-esteem. You're not hurting anyone by it. Then by all means, you know, do what you need to do to make yourself happy and to get to a point where you're going to love yourself. If that is um, eating more healthily so that you can lose a few pounds, if that's, you know, maybe exercising after you talk to your doctor about what type of exercise you can do. Um, I think that the best thing you can do is be proactive about how are the ways that I can proactively love myself more? If that's learning how to dress for my body, if that's putting on some makeup in the morning, you know, going out with a red lip. I love a red lip. It makes me feel <laughs> empowered. <laughs> so like there are things that just make you want to flip your hair. So what are those things? And then going for them. I thought that that question was, like you said, Angela, like, it was so well worded and just such a powerful thing to think about. And I think, I feel like because our bodies are always changing and never staying quite the same, it is always an ongoing journey. Like, you know, self-love, whether that's like internal or external or what, just whole body and soul, I don't think is a destination you get to. I think it's constantly a journey you're working on. And I think also, I think the phrasing of loving everything about yourself, as opposed to accepting everything about yourself, I think those are kind of a different, different topic, because there are a lot of things about my body that, you know, if I were to draw how I would look perfectly, it's not how I am. But there are a lot of those same things that I've accepted as a part of me and as a part of my makeup, that they don't bring me, they don't upset me anymore. They don't make me feel bad about myself. I don't love them, but I've accepted where they, like how I am built. And I think that that's, and as different things change, that journey evolves into learning to accept and sometimes love different aspects of myself. Yeah, love and acceptance. I, I can follow that too. I don't know. Um, I don't think I've had the same relationship with my body throughout the years. Um, 
I get my first medical stuff that happened was I had an ACL tear and then that just completely messed up my calf. And I had two more surgeries that weren't necessarily successful on that same leg. And then as an adult, I had an Achilles lengthening on my right leg. And there was one point as a teenager where I told my mom, I am never wearing shorts again. I'm not going swimming. I'm not going in public. Um, and that's still hard to think about today. But today I do not love those body parts, but I, I have accepted them and they are part of me and they function relatively well now. And I have gotten to the point, um, probably in my late twenties, actually, when I put on shorts and I can go out and maybe I get some weird looks, maybe I can ignore them. <laughs> maybe I don't even care. And I don't notice if people have their looks, but, um, yeah, I think that is a really lofty goal and maybe for me too high of an expectation to, to love all parts of me. Um, yeah. And especially if I really reflect on the bigger stuff, like the aorta that dissected or the iliacs that I had to have surgery on. Like I, I feel okay saying that those are pieces of shit in my body. <laughs> I don't like them and I will never like them, but I, I like myself, I guess, as a whole. Yeah. I love that Mariah. Cause it's, you know, <laughs> as a whole, I'm good. And all these little pieces, maybe I'm not such a big fan of all the little pieces, but you know, overall things are okay. Um, you know, some of what I'm hearing you guys say too, is, is, um, that this is a progressive thing and, you know, you have to, it's cumulative really. Um, and there's, there are these things that you've all talked about that were manifestations of, the condition you live with kind of from the get-go, right? Or um, they were there, whether you had to have a surgery or you had any kind of procedure, but we do have a lot of folks in our community who, who carry significant scars. I know Kendra, you mentioned um, someone asking you about your scars um, and, and some of the questions that we got ahead of time too were about like, taking off a shirt when there are scars. And I know we've talked to kids, especially at our conferences about, you know, now they're proud of their scars because they see all these other kids who are also having the same scar. Um, you know, I, I would love to hear some thoughts on how you've approached those types of, um, you know, sort of uh, how you've approached those things like scars and things that are a result of the condition, but aren't like the, they aren't directly tied to having a condition. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, I was actually just going to ask if I could mention something from the last question. And this actually perfectly ties into it. And it goes towards like, so when I was growing up and everything, I, you know, all my friends were wearing bikinis to the pool and my mom would always get me you know, a one piece and a shirt to wear to cover up my mm -hmm. scars. And it wasn't ever something that I asked for or anything until after a certain number of times of her assuming that I would want to cover my scars, mm -hmm. that then it taught me that I should be covering those. Um, and that those are something to be hiding. And there is an element of you don't want to put your scars in direct sunlight all the time. But there's also this, you know, when we're at an indoor pool, I think it's probably okay. Um, and there was that, or I wasn't supposed to wear skinny jeans because they emphasized how thin my legs were. Um, and with that, like, with the scars, it was something that was taught to me that it's something I should be ashamed of. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't something I felt innately. It wasn't something that I was initially thrown off by, but it was something that was taught to me. Um, and so I think, 
A, if there are, you know, parents thinking about this, don't do that to your kids. Let them lead the way in what they feel comfortable wearing, what they feel, you know, confident in, or at least comfortable in. Um, don't pave the way for them of what you think they should feel comfortable in. Uh, and then for me, a lot of it was just doing it, just going to a water park or, you know, going to my friend's swimming pool in their backyard with friends I felt very comfortable around and being comfortable around them in a swimsuit and then being comfortable in a slightly larger group of people in a swimsuit or with like a low cut v-neck or whatever that's showing off those scars and the more I did it the more comfortable I felt um and that was because I would get a lot of comments if I ever went to a water park because of how thin I am and I think they would notice how thin I was before they noticed the scars. Um, but I think just continuing to do it and being around people that you feel comfortable around, because if I was hanging out with my friends, having an awesome time, I didn't care if other people were looking at me um, because I was having a good time and just practicing that more and more. Yeah, agreed that it takes practice. I think um, I had to find the perfect shorts and I would wear them around the house, um, wear them outside. And then like you said, Kendra, people that I'm comfortable with um, was kind of the first step into going public with my legs and shorts. So it wasn't just sort of an overnight thing where I was okay with it. I mean, I still think about the scars when I wear shorts today, but it's not preventing me from, from doing those things or it's not causing the levels of anxiety or stress that it was before. Brandon had a really nice comment um, related to this as well. He says, all I have said, as I have said before, there's only one me, but that doesn't mean I have to always love me. In fact, more so, I don't like what I see when I'm looking in the mirror. I'm five foot 10 and currently weigh 172 pounds. Most would say that's not bad, but to me, I don't like it. Not so much the numbers, but the appearance. Models and bodybuilders could have the same stats and look totally different. And I understand that. My problem is I don't like the way the weight is distributed through three open hearts, four spine surgeries, full spine surgeries, numerous hernia repairs, things just aren't where they should be to me. I don't want to be a front page model. I just want to wear a swimsuit and be confident. But every day I wake up and look at myself and say, this is the day I'm going to love me because there could never be a more beautiful me. And I really love that, that whole like summary of, I don't necessarily like everything I see in the mirror, but I make the decision every day and, and that's that practice piece that y'all were talking about as well, um, kind of around him as well. And I, for so many reasons, I regret that he's not able to be here with us tonight, but we do have some, you know, we're an all female panel plus our medical professional here tonight, but this is certainly a relevant topic for men and uh, as well. Um, and maybe, um, I don't know if Brad, you would like to address this one just from like a practice perspective, but the question is uh, a male with Marfan syndrome. We hear this a lot in our community, both from young boys, um, those hitting puberty and even older. Um, what is your advice on how to accept the way I look when society expects me to be big and muscular? It's a challenge. It's a, it's a, a, a demographic shift for, for guys as well in terms of the pressures like um, folks were describing on the panel from um, you know, uh, negative pressures from social media to what you see on the television where uh, you, know, you have um, folks who are actors playing high school students who are actually in their 30s and um, have a body image that's not really um, feasible or attainable by uh, anyone for that matter, whether it's um, a medical condition superimposed you know 
like the panel's describing and it, and as a psychologist sitting back and listening, um, it's absolutely wonderful in terms of um, the things that you're describing are exactly the things that we talk about in uh, treatment and, and interventions for helping people um, when negative body image is becoming really problematic. So working towards decreasing avoidance because avoidance just um, keeps people kind of um, trapped within those negative thoughts and feelings and physical sensations. So as Mariah and Kendra highlighted so uh, eloquently, you know, planned, predictable, and under your control, working your way up to challenges where you feel comfortable so that you're, um, rather than avoiding pushing into it. And, and, you know, Kendra highlighted something that just really resonated with me around the idea of acceptance. And one of the things we have to remember, and as a psychologist, one of the things I always try to remember from an old supervisor of mine is that acceptance is an agreement. And so sometimes I accept things, but I don't have to agree with them fully. And I can kind of exist in that space at the same time. I can exist in the space that, you know, body satisfaction isn't the absence of body dissatisfaction. And all of it happens on a continuum. And so um, you know, people have been hitting on a really important point in, in body image work. And from my perspective as a, as a psychologist and what lots of research tells me is, you know, one variable that's really important in, in body image is self-compassion. And self-compassion and how we feel about ourselves as people has a tremendous impact on how we feel about our, our physical appearance and how we cope and deal with uh, any stressor that kind of is, is faced our way. And I think that's something um, that I would say both men, women uh, across the board, uh, you know, what I'm hearing from the panel tonight is a journey of self-compassion and a journey of acceptance. And um, I hope that the, the folks who are, are here joining uh joining the panel or hearing that too because um that really resonates with with everything i know in my limited lived experience as a psychologist sorry i was talking while i was still on mute <laughs> thank you for sharing that Thank you so much for sharing that, um, Brad, because I think um, just to kind of put a point on um, what everybody has been saying, and, and that's that we are all on this journey, right? And there are some additional constraints that we're facing within the community that we are representing here, but um, there are paths forward. I think that is the, the point that I really heard you saying, like there are paths forward, there are multiple ways to do this and um, it's small incremental steps. Uh, I, I um, Psychologists I read a lot from, she talks a lot about 1% changes. Like you're not allowed to try to make any change that's more than 1% per day. And that has really resonated with me. I mean, it's not specifically related to this topic, but I feel like any kind of and it's, it's, but it is related to thinking differently, right? And so we can't just think differently overnight, otherwise it feels inauthentic. And, um, but 1% changes, I can get on board with that because then it's like, this couldn't be simpler, <laughs> but over time it obviously adds up. Yeah, I, mean, what, I wanted to, go ahead. sorry. No, I just wanted to add to um, what all of you have said. Um, so when Kendra said that her mom would, um, not put her in shorts I think that's what she said uh, I had the opposite experience my mom was like like that's not a big deal like wear this like wear these shorts wear this <laughs> skirt and um, for me it was a big deal you know she was like nobody's gonna say anything to you nobody's gonna you know you're with me like like I'm gonna protect you but for me it was a big deal and I think that um like Kendra said again, let let your kids lead. You know, they're the ones going through it and don't minimize their experience or their their thoughts around what they're going through. Because even if nobody else thinks that it's a big deal, if it's a big deal to you, then it's a big deal. And for parents, I would um, suggest instead of approaching these type of things as I'm the parent, I'm going to lead, I'm here to protect you, I know best, approach it with curiosity. Why is it that this is such a big deal for my child? 
um, let me try to put myself in my child's shoes. But knowing, knowing that you would never, you will never fully understand, but you can approach it with curiosity and with empathy and know that whatever's a big deal to them is a big deal, whether it's a big deal to you or not. And like the doctor said, it's a journey. You know, my journey is, and, and everybody's journey is different, right? So you can't also say, oh, they have more friends and look at them. No, you know, you have to respect everybody's journey and everybody's experience and just go through it yourself and try different things, see what works for you, see what feels good for you. Sometimes you have to be brave. Sometimes you really, like, I remember being a deathly afraid of putting on shorts and even through the summers I would wear long pants and then we moved back to Puerto Rico and in public schools over there you have to wear skirts if you're a girl there's no way around it you wear a skirt to school or you don't go to school so I just had to take the plunge and I had to be brave and guess what it was great it was awesome like it was completely different than the experiences I had in Michigan and people were accepting, people were nice. Nobody said anything about my legs. And even if they are, just be brave. Sometimes you have to be brave. Sometimes you just have to try it. If it's not right in that moment and it's not right for you, then you know, go back and you try another time in another situation or you try something else. That's what I would say. Do we want to, um, I'm going to jump us over to the, our last little bit of presentation here too, because I think once again, we're at a great natural arc um, in um, where we were, what we're talking about and what these next few points are. So I'm going to share. All right. So can I add that, hand that one over to you, Brad, if you have any points you wanted to add on to these? Absolutely. And I think that, um, you know, it, it's part and parcel of the discussion that we've been having this evening that, um, you know, body satisfaction, again, isn't the absence of body dissatisfaction. You know, everyone from time to time will have negative things uh, about body image, about um, the condition, and that's totally normal. It really comes down to something in psychology we call the Goldilocks principle. And, and everybody remembers the story of Goldilocks and the three bears. And, you know, the porridge is too hot, the porridge is too cold, or the porridge is just right. Um, if we're never concerned about body image or porridge is too cold, that's not good. But um, neither is being overly preoccupied with it either. We have to find a balance. And the balance, as Adriana highlighted, is different for every person. It's a, it's a journey. Part of the journey is, is being brave as well and pushing pushing them back against that, uh, you know, the tendency sometimes to, to, to you know, avoid. Um, and, and the journey is easier with self-compassion rather than self, uh, self-criticism. Um, being kind to self, you know, something that resonated with me um, from earlier on in our discussion tonight when, uh, you know, Kendra was talking about some of the things that we'll say to ourselves that we would never say to other people, you know, trying to have that same voice for ourselves, um, trying to be able to uh, be kind and compassionate um, and trying to remember that it's a it's a journey it's not a, a destination as she highlighted is is uh, really really important but but another thing that I think really stands out to me from the discussion is that you know we also want to think about how diversified we can be from body satisfaction and dissatisfaction as well every member of this panel is incredibly diversified in the things that um, interest them, what they engage in, makes them who they are. And that diversification also helps with, uh, with body image, being diversified, self-compassionate, um, and trying to find that balance. I don't know what other folks on the, on the panel think. You know, I want to jump in because I do need to um, head out. So I want to jump in. Um, um, this would be the last piece from me. Um, you know, I think compassion, that's a great word. I use a lot, give yourself grace, um, you know, when you're graceful to others, but give yourself grace. So, you know, maybe you, you want to do something, maybe you want to be brave and put on those shorts, but today's not the right day and give yourself grace. 
that's fine. Maybe let's try again next week. Maybe you've been wearing shorts for the past week and then you woke up today and today you're not feeling it. You're back to that place where mm, I don't know why I'm back here when I've been, I've been brave and I've been wearing shorts for the past week and it's been good, but today I'm not feeling it. That's fine. Give yourself grace. You're, you're good. Um, take it one day at a time. Um, maybe now that the new year is just coming, maybe um, make some resolutions that are attainable that you can work towards. Nothing that's crazy and unattainable. Um, and talk to other folks from the community. I never had support system from the community. I wish I did, but I didn't. Um, if anybody wants to connect with me, I'd be more than happy to. Um, you can ask Angela to give you my email. Um, you know, it's sometimes it's really good to have a mentor that has kind of walked in your shoes or is going through what you're going through, even though, you know, my friends, is a spectrum and everybody manifests differently. Um, but I, and I'm going to, I think this is the third time that I'm saying this, but people, when they say they understand I, I'm, I don't agree with that. I think you can say I empathize, but you don't understand unless you walk in that person's footsteps. And so we as a community, we do understand because we've been there because we're there every single day. So that's really important. And that's what I will leave everybody with. Um, my journey to self-acceptance has been peaks and valleys. You know, some days I'm up here, some days I'm down here. And even though right now, you know, I'm wearing my skinny jeans, I'm wearing my skirts and my little dresses. Some days I'm not feeling it. <laughs> Some days I'm not. So you got to give yourself grace and remember that there will be peaks and valleys always. So, and for the teens out there, my heart goes out to you because I know it's not easy, <laughs> but you'll get to a point where, you know, you'll look back and say, you know, I, I went through it, but now I'm better. It gets better. I think a, a, la, a parting message of hope is that it gets better. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. It's been so great hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening, everyone. You too. Other thoughts from Raya or Kendra? I really like what Brad said about diversifying uh you know the goldilocks principle but also diversifying and like finding other things the more i'm like engaging in activities that i enjoy and being around people that support me and bring me love and like me and support me for who i am the more i find myself accepting and liking myself so whether that's like in the last few years, I've had to kind of change the hobbies I participate in because my body won't let me do as much. And at first it was hard for me. I used to rock climb a lot and I had a lot more toned muscle and now I don't have that anymore. And it took me a while to kind of accept that. Uh, I had a friend mention, I was wearing a tank top one day and she said, oh, I'm used to seeing you with all of your climbing muscle. And I was like, okay, all right. And that took some time, but I've found new hobbies and now I'm just a grandma sitting over here crocheting every night. And it brings me so much joy. But when I find things that, find activities that fulfill me and bring me joy, it's more, I just find myself enjoying myself more and in turn accepting and liking myself more. Yeah, maybe that is kind of the natural progression of, of getting older too. I know that um, like turning 40 was a really big deal for me. Um, and not just like in general being a human, but also because of a shortened lifespan with meds. Um, but I think you know, my confidence level has changed, which in turn affects my, my body image. Um, and it, I, for me, I think it really all relates to identity too. And, and doing my best to remember that I am not just my body. Um, 
And there are all these other parts of me that make me who I am. Um, and that is constantly evolving too. I think um, the other day we were talking about maybe having to change other things, not just activities, but you know, your workload or what you do to make money for your family. Um, and that is a huge part of my identity right now. Um, and it's, it is evolving because the realization that, you know, I can't do as much as I did before relating to that um, is hard and will take time to accept. And I don't think I will love it, but I can learn to accept it. Absolutely. I don't know, Angela, do we have um, some additional questions from folks in the, um, in the audience? Um, I've not, we haven't seen any more questions come through. If you have any questions that you would like to add to this discussion, we have about 10 minutes remaining. Um, if, we, if, if there are more questions, um, please drop those into the Q&A. We'd love to discuss other things that might be on your mind. Um, try, I'm just looking through our list here to see if there were any other points that we wanted to make sure and cover. I feel like we've gotten most of these covered um, just through discussion. Um, anything from either you, uh, Mariah or Kendra, that were points that you wanted to be sure to bring up that we haven't had a chance to discuss um, specifically yet? Yes, I wanted to emphasize um, how important therapy is for me and not because I'm a therapist, um, but I, I have my own therapist. Um, and I wish, wish that for everyone that um, I hope that the stigma is lessening in our society about what that means to go see a mental health professional. Um, I think it is so important for me personally. And um, it doesn't mean that every time I have a session that I'm having a horrendous day and um, I mean, I, I make regular appointments to sort of maintain my mental health. Some days I do have really bad days and, and um, that's a day that I have an appointment and other days I'm feeling pretty great. And it's still a great way to, um, to just do my best to try to stay healthy. And it's a little bit preventative maintenance too. Um, and if, you know, there are a ton of professionals out there that see kids too. And I'm a registered play therapist. I would highly recommend finding a play therapist for your kiddos. Um, and I, I'm willing to answer questions or to receive emails um, if people have more questions about um, finding a person for them themselves or for their family members too. I also wanted to, I mean, first of all, I totally agree. Everyone should go to therapy. Um, especially, I think, for kids and teenagers that are going through getting a diagnosis, growing up with a diagnosis like beds or Marfans or anything similar, going through therapy to talk about, you know, the body image issues but also the lifestyle changes and the things you'll have to do differently and kind of being able to have someone that you can talk through that with uh, outside of your family. Um, I know for me, it was often hard to talk to my parents about it because they were also having a hard time with it. So I never felt comfortable expressing some of the things like, um, when I was in high school, I knew that it was going to be unsafe for me to have kids biologically. And I couldn't talk to my parents about it because they also were kind of, yeah. you know, accepting that. And so I think providing a space for yourself or for your children to have someone to talk to that is detached from your whole diagnosis, it does not affect their life. So they can listen with empathy and understanding um, and then there was another point that I was going to make, but, uh, 
oh, the other thing that I was going to say is that one thing that has helped me so, so much with the body image stuff is to stop hiding the diagnosis. Like for so, so long, only I went to small private schools growing up. Everyone knew everybody's family and everything. But the only people I let know about like my diagnosis were my close friends um, because I was afraid people would see me differently or, you know, see me as the sick kid or anything like that. And they already saw me differently. They knew that I was having like that I was out of school once for three months to have spine surgery and all this stuff. They knew I had restrictions and couldn't go to gym class but they didn't know why. And I was dealing with so much, I felt ashamed of this diagnosis. And that was more of the problem than how anyone ever responded to it. And when I started talking openly about it and sharing that after I had my second open heart surgery when I was 20, that's when I started pretty much very confidently, you know, wearing a V-neck that showed my scar. Um, talking about it, not being afraid to tell someone like, oh yeah, I have Marfan syndrome. This is what it means. That really no longer hiding behind shame really opened up the ability to love myself or at least accept myself. And so I just wanna put that out there that I also now use the term disabled, which I am disabled. Everything about my diagnosis affects everything I do. Some people feel comfortable using that term and some people don't, but owning my diagnosis and owning the term disabled really freed me to accept everything about myself. So there's no reason to be ashamed of any of that, I guess is my final thing. So there's another question, couple of questions in here. Um, one is what if in spite of trying your best, your body is quote failing and you can't trust your body. How can you accept this, especially without therapy? We all have our support groups and can connect with others. It's extremely helpful, felt helpful, of course, but a negative self image conjoined with severe disability is so challenging. Are there any books or the resources that you can offer? Um, I think that, sorry. Um, with the VEDS diagnosis, um, and I wish I was more familiar with Marfan, maybe you can relate, maybe not, Kendra. Um, I 100% do not trust my body. Um, there, when something happens, it is very spontaneous, um, and there's not, there's not a lot I can do to prevent that, um, and it is a feeling that can be super overwhelming and, and take over my whole day. Um, and sometimes I do let it do that. And, and then some days it kind of fades to the background. Um, there is a really awesome author out there. Her name is Tony Bernard. I don't know if you guys are familiar with her, maybe Brad. Um, the, my favorite book that she wrote is um, How to Be Sick. I think that's the correct title. And she got diagnosed with um, a very strange chronic illness when she was maybe in her 40s or 50s. Um, and then she also wrote another book, How to Live Well. And there's kind of there's kind of a series. Um, and the reason that I like her books is it just relates to feeling supported and knowing that that we're not alone. I mean, there is something so phenomenal about that feeling. And I can identify initially when I got my diagnosis, there was nobody. I didn't know anyone um, and I did not know of any groups or a way to connect. Um, but I think that that is helpful, at least in my experience to, to remember that even though I do feel very alone sometimes. Oh my gosh, I have so many supportive VEDS friends um, and families and the majority of them, honestly, I have not met face-to-face. -face. It's all been online or, you know, 
um, through the support groups on Facebook or something like that. Um, but may, I bet you have something to add. Me or Brad? Oh, okay. I was just going to add what you said about, you know, not every day you feel great with it. Um, I think that that's something that has been so helpful for me is sometimes it just sucks. Sometimes it's really hard and it is some of the things that we've all had to go through are incredibly unfair and it's okay to sit there and say today sucks. And I've had to kind of remove myself from people who say, well, it could be worse or at least this. No, nope. sometimes it just sucks. And sometimes it's okay to sit there in that terrible feeling and feel it for a moment. Like our bad feelings exist just as often as our good ones do. And it's okay to feel them just as fully as we feel happiness and joy. And one thing that's helped me is taking the time to feel those. When I actually allow myself to sit in that for a little bit, it passes so much quicker. Do you want to add to that, Brad? I saw you have a big <laughs> thumbs up on that one. <laughs> I just have a thumbs up for both. I have nothing, nothing to add, but um, yeah. Okay, we are almost at time, but there is one question in here about being a good ally. Um, and this is from someone who she says, or they say, as someone with hidden chronic, a hidden chronic illness, I understand the support I like to receive. What are some things that allies say or commonly do that are not helpful? We kind of covered that a little bit earlier, but if there is something else you want to add there and what are some actual ways you want to see others support you? I would say throw out the toxic positivity, get rid oh. of the, <laughs> it could be worse, at least this, you know, get rid of all of those statements. We know it could be worse, but it could also be a hell of a lot better. Um, listen, ask how you can help, maybe go beyond asking how you can help and say, hey, can I bring dinner by? You know, offer actual tangible ways of helping or, hey, you know, some of, when I've, you know, recently found out I needed surgery, I've been going through big things like that. Having a friend that's like, hey, do you wanna just go get coffee? If you want to only talk about what's going on in your life, we can only talk about that. If you want to talk about literally everything besides that, that's also an option. But I think listening and knowing that some days, you know, the friends that can come over and sit on my couch and do nothing with me, that's so important because there are days when I can't do anything and being understanding when plans are canceled because I don't feel well. Um, I think listening, not assuming that you know what we're going through. And uh, if you really wanna go above and beyond, you know, when you go out to dinner at a place, you know your friend that can't sit on a bar stool for hours, asking for the table with the low seats, you know, doing mm -hmm. stuff like that to, help us advocate for ourselves and advocate for us. Love it. Yeah, all of that, all of that. And um, re I guess realizing that what helps you might not help someone else. Um, I am definitely an introvert. So coming to visit me if I'm admitted to the hospital is not going to feel good to me um but you can sure send me flowers uh i like flowers but yeah i think it's just very individualized um and so you won't know until you ask well with that i think we are out of questions Specifically, I will just reiterate for everyone on the, um, who's been watching tonight um, or at any point when you are watching this, since this is going to be recorded and shared again, that if you have questions related to this or other topics, please, please ask them at markvan.org ask. That's why we're here. We want you to have answers to your question 
We um, want you to be empowered with all the information you can possibly have, um, and maybe even then some, because we know there's so much to know about these conditions and all of the multifaceted ways that they impact our lives. Um, thank you so much for being here as an attendee. Um, this is an important discussion, and we're so glad that you took the time to listen and engage with the panel. Uh, because it is an important part of living with a connect connective tissue condi condition um, and one that I think allows us to live more full uh, and productive lives when we really um, support our whole selves. And it can be tricky, right, when so much needs to be done medically <laughs> um, to forget that some of these other pieces are just as important. Um, thank you so much. Just, I'm just like bursting with pride and gratitude to all of our panelists for the time and the stories and just the compassion you've shared in this discussion um, from your expertise and also from your lived experience. I, I just, I felt like this was such a powerful discussion and it was only that way because of your willingness to be so open and candid um, and share, share all of yourself with us. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and I guess with that, we will wrap up unless anyone has any one last thing they wanna say. Thank you for putting this together, Angela. Oh my goodness. Thank I'm you. Just yeah. Glad it finally came thank together. <laughs> Have a great rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. <laughs>